unfortunately, we were only able to have eight of us. Two had other issues or job constraints mm-hmm. that they couldn't be here. One of them was Karen Crawford, and she's the one that created our cover. Wasn't it a beautiful cover? Yes. Very eye-catching. Yes. Uh, but she also wrote Behind the Mask in the Last Exit to Somewhere on in the anthology. Let me tell you a little bit about Karen. Karen Crawford grew up in the vibrant neighborhood of East Harlem in New York City. She currently lives in the City of Angels where she writes to exercise those pesky demons around her and within her. I'm going to be putting in the chat how you can follow up with her on Twitter in just a few minutes. But first, let me introduce to you Allison. Allison Meldrum is from Scotland. She wrote The Reward in the House on the Avenue. Writing has been Allison's career and passion for 20 years. After graduating from an, with an MA in English Literature from the University of Journal- Edinburgh, Allison's professional writing journey began in news and feature journalism before progressing to communication and content marketing for a number of years. During this time, Allison built a significant portfolio of published work across local, national, and digital media. Allison currently turned her attention to her first love, writing fiction that engages her readers and does not let go. She has a special interest in the genres of mystery, suspense, and romance, and delivers a twist in the tale to take your breath away. Her short stories have already been published online, attracting positive attention on East of the Web. She's also been a guest contributor on a number of parenting blogs, including Brit Mums, as well as regularly writing for her own blog. I'll be typing in chat after I interview her, how you can follow her also. Now, Allison, give me a, let's give her a hand. From all around the globe. (laughs) Yes, we are. Allison, what inspired you to start writing? Hello, everybody. Thanks for the intro, Kathleen. Um, Lovely to be here. I I would say that probably since the very first time I toyed with the idea of writing fiction, it became quite obvious that really the only thing and the best thing I could write about is what inspires me in life and and my life experiences that I've had so far. Um, I was also sort of brought up on the works of a certain Agatha Christie, reading and watching a lot of her work with my mum so if it was Poirot novels and um the films on tv so that really I think that sparked the kind of mystery in me um I'm also very influenced by parenthood by being a mum and by the trials and tribulations of family life and actually I've just got a bit of an overactive imagination and that needs to have a channel of some sort so that's about it really Okay. Well, how was your experience getting together with 10 other offers and working together? Well, I have to say that that working on this anthology for the place I'm at in my writing has definitely been a defining moment. Just being lucky enough to come together with with nine other um, talented writers, such a diverse group of supportive people, has just been wonderful lovely as it is to have family and friends around you there's nothing that quite beats having like-minded writers that understand the challenges the good days the bad days and to have a project to focus on together I think has been so important okay would you do it again without a doubt Absolutely. And I would recommend it to anyone who's who's thinking about it, especially if they think it's a little bit daunting going out there on your own to just have that sort of um, support group around you. Definitely. Okay. What do you like to write? Well, as I mentioned, I love to write mystery. I would like to think down the line, I'll get further into the suspense genre. Um, And I do like to keep 
readers on their toes a bit and give them a little bit of a special twist at the end just to sort of give them bang for their buck and maybe surprise them along the way. <laughs> that answered all my questions. Okay, I'll let you turn it over to the next author. Well, now I would like to introduce you to Celia Saj, who wrote Shelved and Head in the Sand. Celia Kenna Saj is a fantasy author who lives up to her grandfather's nomadic legacy. She enjoys traveling, especially to places tied to legends and folklore she can include in her stories. An avid reader of romance, fantasy and paranormal novels, she is also a lifelong writer, a poet as a child, a fairy tale teller as a teenager, and now a fiction writer. She writes contemporary fantasy with a touch of romance. Her work includes short stories, flash fiction and novels. Celia currently resides in the United States where she dedicates half of her time to writing. The other half, she teaches languages to college students and opens their eyes to new cultures. So, Celia, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay. Of um, course. <laughs> starting with, when did you start writing? Um, I started writing, well, as you said, uh, a long time ago when I was um, eight-year-old. I started with, uh, with poems and I also had a, a small uh, poem published in a local newspaper, thanks to my dad, who's actually here today. <laughs> and uh, um, it was in a small town, but uh, it worked perfectly. Then I wrote, uh, I wrote fairy tales, but I never published any. I started my, my uh, novels. I started the first novel when I was 13, but he never saw the, the light of day. He stayed in the drawer. He's still there back home. And, um, and now two years ago, I started writing again. And uh, I finished a few drafts of uh, two novels. And, um, and I wrote um, short stories that I published and the ones that I published in Tolerance. Oh, wow, that's amazing. My son's seven, so the thought of him starting to write next year is, that is wonderful. Good for you. <laughs> yes. My nephew is also uh, yeah. eight or nine and he already Never. starts writing. So, you know, I hope Never he'll make it. Young. <laughs> no. Absolutely. <laughs> And then um, what advice would you give to a newbie writer or what advice would you have liked to have had yourself when you first started your career? Yes, well, I have two advices, actually. Uh, the first one is uh, read to write, because at the beginning I felt guilty not to read. I thought I wasted my time. I needed to just be writing, 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 which and it didn't work. I need I don't know what I don't know. I have to actually go around, read about it and also even read the other novels just to see like, you know, how, how other writers do it. And we learn from each other and it's great. And the second one is you cannot do it alone. As you mentioned, Alison, you were saying that, you know, you found this group of people that can understand you and that allows you to go on, that helps you. So whenever you feel like venting <laughs> and your family will just will not have it, then you can find other people, other writers that understand you and you can meet by weekly, monthly. It's such a huge help and you can brainstorm, beta read, critique. It just, it's just a huge, um, a huge help. And uh, I think um, it also allows you to see the world through different eyes. They would see things differently and that also helps for writing. So true. Totally agree. Absolutely. And in terms of what, what sparks your imagination, Celia? Well, uh, my surroundings, <laughs> I just uh, realized I like to travel. Well, we used to travel before, before this, this hard year. And um, I just like to find new places. But uh, now that uh, I was stuck at home for a year, I just uh, used my screensavers. <laughs> they just every day, they just show us new places. And um, and I just and it just sparks my imagination. I actually one one of them was a bridge in Scotland and uh, with a, with a legend. <laughs> yes, yeah. about when you put your water in the in you face in the water for seven seconds and then you get eternal beauty. That was fantastic, and I had like a small story right there. So that's so, so that's nice. what I use anything. <laughs> oh, lovely! Oh, visual stimulation. Well, thank you so much. And I'm just going to pop Celia's contact details in the chat as well. But thanks for that, Celia. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. 
Thank you. And uh, well, I am pleased to, to present Anna. So um, Anna wrote Racialville and Misconception in the Tolerance Anthology. Anna Paulina Lipster was born in Brazil. Her mother tongue Portuguese. She fell in love with the, with the English language, love at first word, as she said, in junior high in the city of Niterói, Rio de Janeiro state. Anna Paulina attended the British Culture School for seven years, and she majored in extramural studies, from which she received the Certificate of Proficiency from Cambridge University, United Kingdom. After immigrating to Israel, Anna Paulina continued to improve her studies of the English language and literature, as well as embellishing her vocabulary, enhancing the use of the language, and learning the craft through many and various creative writing workshops. Anna Paulina has written numerous short stories, some of which are posted on her website and published in this toler Tolerance Anthology. Her book, a, a crime novel entitled Branded, will be out soon. Congratulations. And I will type later the, uh, Anna's information in the chat so you can follow her and check her website. So thank you for being with us, Anna. It has been great working with you. Um, so my first question is, when did you start writing? Well, Salia, uh, when I think about it, um, I can say that I have been writing all my life. Uh, I think I started the moment I learned to read and write. <laughs> as I remember, uh, as a little kid, uh, during family gatherings, I would sleep into a back room and would be found much later sitting on the floor in a corda, reading no matter what I could find. It could be a piece of newspaper, a net pamphlet that somebody just left around. And uh, that, that's what I would do, uh, you know, uh, in elementary school, I would write at the back of the notebooks, uh, I would invent dialogues between the teacher and pupil uh, you know, the ones that I could uh, uh, remember from, uh, from the class. Amazing. Or I would um, uh, write short stories, which I would discard later. <laughs> <laughs> I started writing in Portuguese, and then I changed to English. So. Oh, it's amazing. And so you already... Uh, told us uh, what sparked your imagination when you were a kid but now what sparks your imagination um anything anywhere you know an idea can come from an article in the newspaper and uh, it doesn't mean that i will write about the art anything in the article it just you know gives me a spark um or a phrase that i read in a book yes. it can spark a whole story um even a conversation that I cannot avoid listening in a restaurant, you know, people <laughs> like to talk loud. So uh, I get uh, some phrases and I, I write something. And um, uh, also I got many ideas when I wrote uh, to work by bus. Uh, you know, I would listen to uh, the people talking there or in waiting rooms. Uh, I would make up stories about people I saw to appease the boredom of waiting. That's what I, you know, I would look at uh, people there and uh, I would imagine scenes and dialogues. Um, I, I worked for many years for various airlines. And uh, as such, I used to travel frequently. And so Leah, believe me, airports are a plentiful source of ideas for stories <laughs> in any weather. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the advice. I, I should start doing that. I waited until I get to the places before <laughs> getting sparks, but th that's a great advice. <laughs> and what do you like to write? What genre is your favorite? I prefer fiction, preferably crime novels. Uh, first of all, because it's also my favorite um, kind of reading material. Um, but I also enjoy writing about utopic matters, social, psychological issues. Um, I enjoy writing stories with um, uh, something that will surprise the reader at the end. That's what I aim, usually. 
um, I like to write story with unexpected endings because these are also, uh, you know, the, the, this is also the genre that I enjoy reading most. Absolutely. I, 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 can, I agree. And uh, I cannot <laughs> wait to read your book, your prime book, branded soon, just to get surprised. Thank you, thank <laughs> thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Celia. <laughs> Okay, um, now um, Brandon Cuddle, although uh, he wasn't able to uh, be with us today, uh, I want to introduce him to you. Uh, Brandon wrote Just an Egg and the Box uh, for our anthology. Brandon is a recovering Floridian currently on the left coast. He works in pseudo technology and has an innate ability to find the best street tacos in every city. <laughs> so now uh, I'm very glad to introduce to you Jonathan Baird. Jonathan is a husband, father of three daughters, and an optimist. Some might say Micawber. He was born in Biloxi and never imagined living anywhere else. However, after leaving, he never imagined moving back. The more he sees of the world, the more he wants to see. Currently, he lives in Fairhope, Alabama, the hidden jewel of the state. While his favorite genre to write is in science fiction, he has completed and is polishing Seafood Capital of the World, which is a historical fiction novel set in the Prohibition era on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. When he isn't writing, he's thinking about writing, even if it looks like he's doing something else, like work. He has a, an answer for everything, an opinion on anything, and is quiet about nothing. <laughs> now, uh, Jonathan, uh, what is the thing you tell yourself to keep on when you feel like quitting? Well, when it comes time for me to think about quitting, I'm reminded of a uh, time that I took my daughter to see Weird Al Yankovic at the Hard Rock uh, Casino in Biloxi. And I pointed out to her a drum head that was signed by Alex Van Halen that said, knock down seven times, stand up eight. <laughs> and if she doesn't get anything else from me, I hope that that's what uh, she learned from me. Well, well, that and a love of both Weird Al and Van Halen. Okay. And the, um, what inspires you to write your stories? So both of these stories were very 2020 to me. Uh, the first one was actually the, the B-side, Salvation Beach, was a story that was inspired by a, a parable my dad had once told me. And he told it, and then I embellished it to become a story about a church that had lost its way. And uh, the fact that I may have been a member of that church at the time is completely coincidental. Uh, but there are other points based on, on my life and his life as well. And my dad passed away in February of 2020. Uh, so he never got to see the finished work, but that's why the story feels so 2020 to me. Half Vast was originally conceived as a story without a plot. And uh, the fact that I found a plot surprises no one more than me. Uh, it was very fun having less is more as my protagonist, uh, an antagonist named Just In Case, uh, talking about things that were neither black nor white with an intermediary by the name of grayscale. But the very last scene, uh, or the next to last scene, was really the reason both that I found the plot and that the story felt so 2020, because it was some thoughts that I began to have as I was driving down the beautiful downtown uh, government boulevard in Mobile. Okay. Um, now, what advice would you give to other authors uh, who are thinking about doing an anthology? So I'd actually give this advice 
not only for an anthology, but just writing in general. And that's jump in with both feet. Don't look back. Don't hesitate. And if you get knocked down seven times, stand up eight. All right. So now I'm going to introduce Henya, who is uh, someone that I actually got to know a little bit before we started this process. Um, she also wrote The Limits of Autobiography and Photographs with a Missing Head. Henya comes from a rich cultural background. She was born in France to Polish parents and raised in Israel, then came to America at an early age. Writing novels was always her wish, and now she has Stolen Truth coming out, making it a reality. She has short stories published in numerous magazines, and she's a regular contributor to Medium.com. When she's not absorbed in writing her third novel and spending too much time on her computer, Kenya's passions include lifting weights, spinning, and cultivating her large garden. She and her husband live in New York City. So, Henya, I want to ask what you had for breakfast, but instead, what I'm going to ask you is what inspired you to write your choices of stories here? Uh, my family background to begin with. By the way, my breakfast was just a uh, juice. Um, in case you were curious. Um, so what was the question again? Is what inspired you to what write inspired your story? Okay, my family background, um, not really knowing much about the background, but trying to guess most of it, that prompted me to, to know, take facts as they are, as they were from World War II, and embellishing on it and inserting my parents in there and the bits and pieces that they gave me. Um, and that actually I used to write many years ago and these stories are not that new. And then I ventured out to different kind of writing. Okay, what genre do you like to write and why do you write in that genre? I like to write psychological thriller as I like to read psychological thrillers or thrillers of any kind. Uh, the kind of reading that keeps you at the edge of the seat, the kind of reading where when you turn a corner, you don't really know where you're going to end up. The kind of story where it makes your heart palpitate. The kind of stories that there are so many trials and tribulation that you have to continue turning the page to see what's going on in the next page and on and on. This is really, when I write, this is what I aspire. I want to keep you at the end of this receipt. So psychological thrillers and being interested in people's cues, the body language, what they say and how they say it, what mm -hmm. they wear and don't wear. So all of that goes into my books. I know that I personally am anxious to get my pre-ordered copy of Stolen Truth. And I know we are, we're not very far away from being able to see it. So my last question to ask you here this morning is, uh, when did you stop thinking of writing as just a wish that you wanted to do and start really considering yourself to be an author? As all of you know that Calling ourselves authors at one point or another, especially when we begin to write and we are not published, we feel like, and it took me quite, quite a long time, but I can, this is actually my third novel, the one that's coming out on the 18th. I'm working on, I'm working on a fourth novel. I think after I finished the first novel, when I started calling myself a writer, but then the uncomfortable thing was, is where are you published? Where well, not published. So, you know, you're trying to sort of weasel your way into saying, well, I am a writer, but I'm not published yet. So it really does count. Jonathan, thank you very much for the wonderful questions in the intro. And now I'm going to introduce to you a letter B. A letter B whom I met, as I met all of you, and it was such a pleasant surprise to meet all of you. 
She's an emerging author and she's a licensed marriage and family therapist in private practice. Fascinated by how people influence each other, misunderstand each other, and ultimately love each other. I think it's so beautiful the way she said that. It resonates with me. Aleta was an English literature major at Duke University. She received her doctorate from the Institute of Contemporary Psychoanalysts and taught English for senior high for several years. And after 30 years of almost exclusively reading clinical nonfiction, her love of fiction was born out of an incident when a neighbor psychologically threatened her friend. So Aleta felt compelled to write a short story about it. And I assume that after that, she got the ball rolling. She's currently working on the second draft of her novel in progress, Mommy Do Over. This is a story of Melissa, a 55 year old artist who faces lung cancer diagnosis and desperately wants to heal her relationship with her recovering alcoholic son. She lives in Culver City alongside the late MGM mate for its thousand movies. She enjoys watching the 47 ducks and 24 koi who populate the lake. So Aleta, I have a yes, few ma'am. questions for you. Yes, <laughs> yes. I would love to know about your writing journey. If you can share it with us. Sure. Well, it's, it actually started in, in grade school. I would make little stories and give them to the teacher and the teacher would be so pleased and put me in front of the reading, the reading class. So I felt like a little teacher's pet when it actually my social life in first grade was the pits. So this was a little, a little savior in my life. And then another time when I was in high school and madly in love with this boy who was, who was a writer and he was going off to Yale that year. And so I wrote a story about how the ocean had turned to stone so no boats could leave. So <laughs> I write out of people that I love and care about and what could happen to them. So that, that's one thing. In, in the stories that I wrote for this anthology, both of them were kind of like that. The, uh, the one in the front, uh, the first story called A Fly on the Wall, came out of a comment that a man made when I was going off to, to go to a women's meeting of, of friends in my neighborhood. We meet every Sunday night by Zoom now. And he said, oh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall with you women. I know you gossip all the time. So I, I took offense at that <laughs> position and view of women and decided to do something about it. So that's what that first story is about. Um, the second story, which I actually wrote first, was the one that Henya just, just mentioned. I had a girlfriend and a new neighbor moved in and that new neighbor gave her hell. And I don't wanna ruin the story and, and having you have the delight of uncovering the, the deceit in Deceit and Dirty Laundry. Uh, but I was so outraged on, on the side of my friend that I had to do something. So I wrote that story. So yeah, psychological, uh, a psychological injury can be more, it could be pretty bad, worse than having a physical injury sometimes. Yeah. My next question is, uh, so you mentioned the novel. Can you tell us a little bit about your novel? About the novel? You're working on now? Is that what you said? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, yes, the novel. At first, I thought I would write a story about a shy woman, artistic type who blossomed. And then I thought, well, that's nice, but it, so what? It's one person growing. And then I thought, well, what if her growing had interfered with somebody she loved? That would be much more interesting. So then I thought, well, what's the most powerful thing in being a woman uh, and having two sons? Uh, a, a relationship with the son would really be gripping. And I had had clients who have come to me 
who were estranged from their parents. I'm thinking of one woman in particular. She was dying of cancer. She was estranged from her mother and they came to me to help them sort out the communication so they would be able to have the mother treat her at home. And it was so moving to see what happened between the two of them and how they were able to work together that it really solidified that desire. So between occasional distances from my own sons that are painful and lots of clients who have the same issue, I thought this might be a worthy thing to look at. Actually, it sounds like something I would love to read. So I hope you keep me up to date with that. Thank All you. of us up to date. Thank you. So can you tell us what you like to read? What inspires you when you read? What do you like to read? Right now, I'm reading Judy Pico because there are a lot of the same issues and I like to see how somebody else writes about them. I've heard people say they don't like her, but I'm getting value out of it because it's so personal. Um, And I'm, and I'm actually even fairly new to it. It was uh, Elizabeth Stout, it was Olive, and Olive again, the two books that got me back into one that, wow, that's so powerful. I want to be able to do something like that. But for the previous 30 years, it had been clinical books. So this is a whole new sea change. Wonderful, it sounds fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you for your answers. Thank you. And so, was it my turn for Brandon? Let me get my little thingy up here. Brandon, I wish I could see your face better. I but think you're introducing me. Kevin. Kevin. It's Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry. I do mean sorry. Kevin. Well, I will. <laughs> so, Kevin, I'm just fascinated. You live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, you're married with three children. And one of the things about your resume that just fascinated me is that you have a BA in Russian language. And then you were at the American Embassy in Moscow. And I'm just wondering what got you started with wanting to learn the Russian language? So uh, early on in high school, I just had an impulse to, to learn something difficult and I needed to complete a language and I, uh, it, my junior year in high school, I enrolled in a two hour after school program, which would also uh, provide college credit. At, a, at uh, another school, it was a half hour bus ride there and back, and it was two hours long. I would get home at like seven o'clock at night. And I had a, so I had a two hour immersed Russian language class every day for that year. Uh, and I remember, you know, p adults around me saying, why are you doing that? Learn, study a language you, you, you can use like Spanish. And I thought, you know, everyone speaks Spanish, I, I, you know, here in New Mexico. Uh, and I just wanted a challenge. So I, I, after, after I got into the university, I, I took the route that I think people around me did uh, going into engineering. I got through calculus and I bombed out on one chemistry exam and I and I didn't know what I was going to do and I thought I need to study something I like I said well I used to study Russian and I enrolled in, into the Russian program there the University of New Mexico and I realized the first day that I was the only person who could say anything I could read and I could read and write print script in Russian and I could and I had a somewhat developed base you know for the language and the head of the department was teaching the class. There was only like five of us in the first class. She took me to the side later and said, you know, you really got this. And I was sort of a working class guy, worked on, a, on the UPS dock at the time. Uh, and she said, you know, they had just gotten rid of all these Russians who worked at the American embassy. And they, and they were scouring universities to find people who spoke Russian mm. for various jobs that from from custodians up to telephone operators, everything. And uh, so she said, you might like this. So I applied 
And it took uh, every six months I had to reapply. So by the time they called me up, uh, I had uh, I was just starting the 300 level Russian, Russian 301. And they gave me a Russian exam over the phone, someone in the State Department. And they hired me. Uh, they gave me a top secret clearance and a diplomatic passport. And I was just a kid and they shot me out there. And I got there a day before the Gulf War started and they kind of shot, barricaded everything down. They had lost my luggage. It was January. Uh, I didn't get it for five days. Um, it was just, it was brutal. And it was the Soviet Union then. I mean, you really couldn't go out and get everything that you wanted, you know? So it took a couple of weeks. Uh, but when I showed up, there was about, there was like 12 other young guys, all in our early 20s. I hadn't finished school yet. They just gave me a Russian test over the phone and said, good enough, let's go. And we showed up and they, and somebody came to a room and, uh, and said, who speaks Russian? Raise your hand. And about half of us did. They said, okay, you guys are GSO assistants. You work for the, for the, for the foreign service officer in, in that department. The rest of you are laborers. And then we would, it was so, uh, it was fun, really. Just a bunch, of young, a bunch of young guys. And we would, we didn't really have a boss in our office. We would show up and the person who was the lead of our group would go to another office and get a bunch of envelopes. And they would only have written on the envelope, A, B, C, D, and someone would have a plus or something like that. We would open up the envelopes and then we would see what we had to do. And each day we would break up into groups and take care of these things that could be going to the airport. Every Tuesday we had to meet a courier, you know, the guy with the, with the briefcase yeah. cuffed to his hand uh, and, or, or go to the ambassador residence um, and do anything that they needed done. Under the, under the ground of the embassy, there was a, there was a parking lot with, with, with 100 vehicles that we could choose from, from Jeeps to buses to sedans. And we would just go get any vehicle we wanted and go do everything we had to do. When, 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 when communism fell uh, at the end of 91, you know, that next year, uh, all of these other, the, for, the former republics of the Soviet Union were breaking apart and we broke up and, uh, and we went, we flew off to different republics. I had to go to Belarus. Some people went to Kazakhstan and other places. And I mean, another guy, in, in uh, it was January of 92, flew off to, or took a train to, to, to Belarus. And, and I remember um, having my own train, uh, my own room on the train with all of uh, the diplomatic cargo, with just crates, things that were crated and bolted shut. And my job was just to watch those things until we got there. And then the, the train stopped, everyone unloaded off the train, and uh, the foreign service officer who I was sort of working for went to go find a, a man with a card and a taxi. And all of a sudden, I'm the only person on the train, probably except for the conductor, because as I'm watching all this stuff and I can't carry these eight, eight or nine crates out, which filled the room that I slept. And I slept in a room in between all the crates. And there were there was fax machines and telephones and computers in these crates that couldn't get in the hands of anybody else. And that all of a sudden, the train starts leaving the station. I'm the only one on it. And I was absolutely mortified. And I, I'm running to the door and thinking, wait a second, I got to stay with the stuff, but I can't stay on this train. And I'm running from the door down the hallway of the train into my room thinking, well, I can't stay here either. And <clears throat> I go to the door and I can see the grounds going past me. And I can see uh, the, the, the foreign service officer running. With, and, and there's another guy running with a cart pushing along and I was running back and forth through the train bringing the crates out and, and just handing them to them some of them were falling into the gravel on the side of the tracks I'm surprised we 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 made it off I jumped off the train before it completely left the station and it was just incredible uh after two years of that I still hadn't finished school I had to leave and so I came back to New Mexico where I finished where now I was studying I was in, actually in political science then, I just came back and decided just to study Russian and I just walked right through it. That's where I met my wife. Professor didn't show up. We had a, a Russian literature class and I left 
left the, uh, the tr after 15 minutes, the teacher didn't show up and I opened the door and there was my wife. My wife now wasn't then. And, and I said, uh, the teacher's, the professor's gone. Do you want to go get coffee? And she said, yeah. And we spent every day together since. Beautiful story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's lovely. Um, so I, from your experiences, you are in exactly the right place to write the genre that you most like to, adventure, mystery, and horror. <laughs> Some horror. It turns out to be horror. I don't know why that keeps coming out. <laughs> why did you adventure and mystery and horrible things happen? <laughs> But you, in, in your statement about horror and mystery and, and adventure, you say they have a common theme of human growth and transformation. How do you, how do you put the horror and transformation together? How do, they, how do you uh, think of you that? Know, um, challenging circumstances, and those can be horrific circumstances, can force you out of who you are into the person that you have to become in order to survive. Uh, or you find through that, you, you, you grow out into somebody else entirely. And that has, that has been the common theme. I've realized that though I'm writing adventure, I realized the main character is always driven really to find them true self, their true self through the circumstances, which bring it out. So it's almost like, it's almost a gift in some way, these horrible things that allow them to grow. Beautiful. Beautiful. One more thing I wanted to ask you. You, you. One of the questions we asked you was, "What advice would you give a newbie writer?" And you, you said to find your voice. Yeah. But what I want to ask you is, how did you find your voice? I think that uh, when I first started writing, I always wrote and had an uh, imagination that I thought was uh, a burden. And I mean, I couldn't drive anywhere, and I, my mind would go off into my imagination, dreaming up stories that I would rehearse in my mind. And then I would end up where I was driving to thinking, well, I don't even remember driving here. Like half of my, half my brain was, was providing me my entertainment and the other half was doing its job. And, and, I, and I decided once, even though I've tried many times to write a page or write an idea down and it never went anywhere. And then one time, I decided I'm just going to write, and it turned into ten thousand words and twenty thousand words, and, and before you knew it, I I I I had a I had a novel in front of me, and it took me the whole summer, the three months, and then more time after that to edit it, of course. And I realized I can do this. I just need I just somehow got to where the the working part of my brain that was focused and the imagination part of my brain here sort of came together. Had I not, had I, had my brain not been free, had I not been free to just have an imagination, I would have never found my voice. But maybe that's not entirely it. You have to be able to, pu to pull it together so that you can plan and imagine at the same time. I used to consider myself a pantser where I just wrote, wrote, but I realized though that I can, most stories start with a, an idea or event, like a, a certain event occurs and that, and I, and then I can see maybe that vent is in the middle of the book, but it, I can see the before and after of it, how it got there, and then what that that primary event. Usually, it's the inciting incident, or maybe the climax uh -huh. that how that ends. And so, um, I forget. I, there was a distraction there, um, and so I've learned how to then outline what I want. These are all the events that have to occur, and then I sort of like write freely with you know a free stream of consciousness in between those sections where I get most of the creativity out. And that fascinating. I wanted to ask you one I lied. I want to ask you one short question. In your story with uh, the mascot, if that's how you say it, M -A -M -A -C. Okay. when it's I when I, I thought is this an Italian mascot? Or what is this? So I Googled it and it's a town in Florida. So I never really could figure out how it matched your story or what was the purpose uh, Mascote, of that. Mascote is, Mascote is how it's pronounced, which means mascot. Yeah, I believe in, in French and maybe someone else could tell me if that were entirely true. I looked it up and I wanted, I wanted another word for that and Mascote was perfect. And, and you've read the story. 
So you know kind of what happens. Yeah, but yeah, it fits a story, but it didn't fit Florida. I've seen that. No, it's a, it's a translation of the word mascot. Okay. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really enjoyed getting to know you better through this. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll, I'll take over here and I'm going to introduce Kathleen Osborne, uh, who, who wrote for the book Love Spark and Where'd They Go. Uh, she was a late bloomer in writing. Uh, as far as writing goes, she always wrote, but never short stories and novels until December of 2019. She had written two no she uh, written two novels. One she is working on editing now and turning into a trilogy, uh, and now she's and she's editing the first draft on another. She started working on short stories around uh, June 2020 using contests as as another approach. So far, she has entered four contests. Uh, she's been married for 44 years and has two children, uh, the oldest of which, Angela, and her husband have three children. Uh, her second, Joseph, and his wife have two children. She retired from the Air Force in 1991 after 21 years of service. She lived in several states and overseas, twice in England and Turkey. She's had four other careers in life, and I think she believes this is going to be the last one. Uh, she has many stories stored up inside of her. And I would like to ask her some questions. Are you there, Kathleen? I am. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, regarding this book, Tolerance, how was your experience sitting together with all the authors and working together? Would you do it again? Yes, I would. In fact, I think we're planning on doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun. Uh, we want to do it again this fall, and we've been talking about doing something on seasons. So uh, we'll see what turns up and what happens, but it'll come out probably early fall in time to cover October, November, and December. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, then uh, what advice would you give to other authors, no, that's not, that's not the question I wanna ask you. Yeah, what advice would you give to a newbie writer? Or what advice would you have wish someone had given to you before you started? Actually, um, I didn't have anybody give me any advice other than in high school saying I couldn't write. Uh, that's why I hate red on paper. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it was a book I read it was on writing and it said, just shut up and sit down and write. And that was the title, just sit down and write. And so uh, December of 2019, I sat down and 60 days later, I had a hundred thousand word novel. And um, it was very, very involved. And I knew it was, super involved and I didn't know how to handle it. Um, Jack Martina was one of the people that told me it's very involved. <laughs> and uh, so I took it to an editor and she said, well, that's because it's a trilogy. <laughs> so, so we split it into a trilogy and I've written the second part and I'm editing that. We're finishing the editing on the first one which hopefully will be out in June. If not, it'll be sometime September of the summer. And then in a couple of months after that, we're hoping the second one will be out in early spring of next year, the third one. Um, but I'm also working on another novel, which I don't know if you were gonna ask me this question or not about where I get my ideas. Yes, Kevin. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you what sparks your imagination. So we'll go into that. Okay. Um, People spark my imagination. TV shows. Last night, um, we were watching a science show and it was all about the extrasensory perception. I'm not talking about, um, you know, bending spoons or telepathy or anything like that. It's about people who can see, but they're blind. 
people that can hear um, colors. Now, isn't that a good book? Yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool to have a character that can do this, but can't talk about yes. it because everybody poo-poos them and says, no way until they meet, well, you know, I'm a science fiction writer, an alien <laughs> who understands. <laughs> and their people do that all the time. But that's one of the things. The other things, um, prompts. You know, I got given a um, prompt of a guard falling asleep. And that's where where they go came from. It's in a southern jail, deep south. And all of a sudden, the guard wakes up from his midnight nap and all the prisoners are gone. It's the, I think it's the shortest story in the book. So I'm not going to say any more because it will ruin it. It's funny. I think it's the only comedy one in the book. And then the other one, it was um, just an idea. I read something somewhere about a spark flying to someone else and it doing something to them. So, okay, love spark. They touch and there's a spark and love I mean, it means that they're true mates, but they grow to love each other almost instantly. And I'm not going to say anymore because I, I like romance too. I, I, I love I, happy I, endings. I, yes. I remember that one. I'm just saying I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the longest one in the book. <laughs> <laughs> they were very forgiving. More? Kevin, was there anything more you wanted to say about remembering that one? He says, because I don't want to ruin it. Uh, I just think that I don't want to say. Now, I do want to say that this has been so much fun working with these 10 people. I couldn't, you know, all it was was me saying, I have a, a goddaughter and she's had stage four cancer for over eight years. And um, all she can do is read short stories. She can't handle a long novel. So an idea came to me for doing short stories, something for people who have, like my father was uh, attention deficit, had adult ADD. If he read more than a magazine article, he'd fall asleep. Didn't mean he wasn't a brilliant man. That's just the way he was built and the way my goddaughter is. So having something short, short stories, a book of them that was eclectic from people, none of us write in the same genre, I think. We have such a mix in there that you're gonna love it when you read it. And I wanna tell you that right now it's on sale. 99 cents. Uh, American, and it's at all the major retailers online. It is the ebook. We're waiting to get the print book. It is going to come out in print. And I also, Jonathan called me the, or texted me this morning. This is awesome. Now it's only been out a few days. It's number 304 in fiction anthologies already. It's 410 mm -hmm. in the time travel fiction. And it's 427 wow. in science fiction. That is astounding. Wow. Yeah, considering and, that there's literally four, four million, five million books, uh, it, it's not uncommon to be at 700,000. Yeah. So 400 is, is, is at the top, it's in the top 1%. So applause to my fellow authors and applause to you for coming and joining us today. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our audience. We have already a few questions. So if the you first have one. some questions. Could I say something first before? I, I, just wanted, I just wanted to thank one of the audience members, Ruth Light. She has been an inspiration to me about writing for, for decades. She's a writer herself, among other things, uh, Montessori School founder, uh, but we used to do stuff together and that always 
gave me a good feeling about writing. So thank yeah. you, Ruby. <laughs> I'd like to, I'm going to have everybody introduce everyone. Um, I'm going to start with Martina. Um, she is also, uh, she's the movie behind her. Martina, you might want to drop your head a little bit. She is the producer for that. And I believe her daughter wrote the wrote it. Did she not? Okay. Yes, she did. And, um, but I've known her for, what, 30 years, 20 years? Yeah. yeah. We knew each other in California. <laughs> now, if the other ladies would be introduced, Salia, are they your friends? <laughs> so I have my family. Okay, and, would you and introduce? A, and another writer okay. is with us also. I have my, my, yes, my father, he's in Morocco. My sister Nina is in Dolestan, Pennsylvania. Uh, Zaki is actually my nephew. He is five years old, <laughs> but his mother, I think is behind the screen. And my other sister, Behia. Behia is my aunt from Canada. And uh, El Michel is my writer friend. She's, okay. uh, she's, she lives in Connecticut. And oh, wonderful. And um, I don't know, Suzanne. Okay. So I we also did... have some friends here. Yes. If I could, uh, one is um, uh, Diane Sancho. He, she uh, helped me with uh, editing my book, The Branded. And uh, Susan Meyer is also here. Awesome. Who's, who's next? Who else has friends here? We have Diane. Who's Diane's friend? I have somebody here. Okay. <laughs> Not just somebody here. But I have uh, my cousin. I've always called her Gina, but her, her screen here says Regina. Uh, and she and I have uh, talked writing for a very long time. My, uh, my grandmother, our grandmother, actually had written a book uh, way back before she passed that none of us can find anymore. Um, but you know, she was a very big inspiration for us. She uh, kind of made us grammar nerds. And uh, I think that's a, a lot to, to, to do with what we do. But uh, I've just recently learned more about Regina in just a few of her blog posts. And I think I knew about her for her whole entire life. And uh, I've known her my whole entire life. So thank you for coming. Oh, I remember when you were born. <laughs> I see now that uh, also Estelle uh, Chasen is here. Um, okay. I didn't see her before. So hi, Estelle. Thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm delayed because I've got this other voice in my head. It won't go away and I can't unplug. So I apologize. Okay. Uh -oh. uh, we Everybody got introduced? I think we all have other voices in our head. That's why we write. <laughs> I just Diane. want to say that um, I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm extremely impressed with all of you writers. Um, and uh, how did I get here? Susan uh, is my neighbor. And over the, um, the lockdown in Israel, we started walking together. We were first only allowed to walk one kilometer away from our homes. And after that, more and more. And we got chatting and she said, you know, I've got a friend who's, um, I'm an English teacher, by the way, and I do editing for um, uh, a publisher who publishes uh, English language uh, school textbooks. I have, I edit for him, but I have written for him as well. And Susan said to me, I've got a friend who's writing some things and uh, do you know an editor? So I said, oh, I'd love to do it. And that's how I met Anna. And Estelle, who Anna me uh, mentioned, who's just had to leave the meeting, uh, is a published writer herself. She's written four novels and uh, we've known each other all our lives. And so the circle goes round and round. While I don't write myself, um, I am a, I'm an, a bibliophile, an anglophile. Uh, I love uh, reading and I really enjoy editing and being a teacher obviously is bringing out what is inside. 
Mm -hmm. people, and I've loved working with Anna. And uh, thank you for introducing me to this group. It's really been very interesting. And good luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. So, okay, so Leah, you want to read the questions that we have? Yes, so I think the person already left, but she asked, uh, she would like to know how we all found each other. Who would like to take this Wait, one? The, the rightpractice.com is an international uh, collaborations of different authors or aspiring authors. And it's where you can uh, learn how to uh, write and self-publish and how you can write a book in 100 days. They walk you through it. Uh, and other things, how to do short stories. They do short story contests and stuff. And they have a little cafe where you can, if something's going on and you've got a question or you need help, you can uh, write in that and say, help, I need help, or I have a question. And after, like I told you about my goddaughter, I went in there and I thought, well, I can't write an anthology myself. So I put in a message, who would like to join me in writing in an anthology? And these nine wonderful people joined me. Some of them, I had already edited their stuff. They had edited mine. So we had met that way, but we had never talked to one another, never met face to face or anything like that. And that's how it happened. Yeah, and one of them blew your mind with his with his right. <laughs> one of them did. <laughs> yes, Kevin. Oh. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Tell him a little more. <laughs> Pardon? I'm, I'm going to continue to blow minds. It's what I do. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I should be. I should put myself down as a demolition expert because that's what I do. I blow minds. Yes, that's room. right. That's right. That's that you did. Worked, that you did. I worked the wires up, I worked the wires up to, your, to your ears and I just, and then it just blows you away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. It's, okay. uh, the second question was from Martina and uh, she's asking us if any one of us have a literary agent and if yes, how we, how we found them. Uh, she also say to let her hear about uh, the Christmas stories for her movies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for offering. Yes. I, can, I can actually just say that I don't have a literary agent yet, but I'm, on, I'm querying. And uh, to find them, I went on Writer's Digest. I just go to conferences. So I've been looking around and um, I've sent some queries, but I don't know if anybody else. So. Uh, Henya, do you have a literary agent? Yes, I actually did have a literary agent and I uh, fired him after a while because, and he was with uh, one of the top agencies in Manhattan on Fifth Avenue. And uh, he believed in my book very much, only he was moving a little bit too slowly. Mm -hmm. So after a great deal of soul, soul searching, I decided to go to a medium-sized publisher and within a few days they picked me up and they're wonderful, they really are. They do everything for me. So you don't necessarily have to go to the big publishers. The medium size and even small publishers um, can do a lot for you because the bottom line is it's still up to you to go out there and buy to your market, whatever, to get released. Either way. That's so right. don't get discouraged, but it took me a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Aletta, what about you? Do you have a, a literary agent? Did you say Yes, yes, Aletta. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, I don't. Uh, I have a person who might become that, but it's far from being a commitment yet. Okay, I think the rest of us are all... Well, at least I am. I'm going self-publish. Yeah, because I, I, you've got to do the work yourself anyway. So yeah. what's the next question? And the next question is from Regina. Uh, what were your logistics for collaboration and how did we manage? We met weekly through Zoom. Um, and if anybody needed help, 
uh, they reached out to one another in between. Um, anybody had any questions? We tried to videotape the Zoom meetings because not everybody could make it every time. Um, most, of, most of the writers of the anthology have a J-O-B. So if that, that was, took precedence because most everybody has a family. And um, so Leah was my right-hand person. Yes, yes, she is very, I'm computer savvy, but she is yeah. really computer savvy. Uh, and some of the programs. And then we were the ones that finally put the manuscript together once everything was done. But we, um, through Jonathan, we were able to get a very good editor that um, she was a family member and helped us out. She also was uh, trained to become a grammar nerd by our grandmother, Mama Bird, that is Edie Lemagne. <laughs> but um, it was so wonderful what she did for us. And um, I will say that. That was the only expense that we had. We were able to do everything else at no cost. We, so, um, and that was our goal because none of us are wealthy to be able to handle the, the total cost or anything like that is to just work through it and, and do it the best we could. And we did. And the, I'm so proud of us. When you see the manuscript, you'll understand why, because it is so professional. It truly, truly is. Next question. Well, I we hope have that more the question, Regina. Oh, yes. <laughs> and we have co comments. So, uh, El Michel is saying congratulations to all of you on your success. Martina is saying congrats to all, and my sister actually left a comment. I'll ask her to unmute if she yeah. can share it with her. Yeah. I started typing and then I pushed enter and then I realized it was a complete mess. <laughs> and I am going to be, <laughs> I'm not an author. I don't usually write, but let me tell you, you have been absolutely a source of inspiration um, through you. And I am very thankful through you, my patients who actually take our emphysema COPD patients that have had so much intolerance in the current um, world because as soon as they cough, as soon as they sneeze, as soon as they try to go someplace, they are looked down upon and everybody is terrified of getting the virus. And it has been their life to cough all around, but uh, they've never really experienced anything with regards to intolerance until this year. They have been mm -hmm. in front of what's happening. And I am happy to say that I have a master class to uh, coach them through their journey. And your book is part of the package that they're going to be getting. Um, oh, so I'm so happy that you have this book. It was perfect timing. The class oh, immediately after. Wonderful. Each. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to offer them something that they can look forward to to be able to escape the crazy world that we live in right now. Thank you. Somebody writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, write that down. Write that. Go it's online. It's recorded. It's it recorded. Yes. <laughs> <We're here. laughs> yes. For, for those of you who uh, don't know, if we need as many reviews as possible in as short a time as possible so that we can get pushed way up to the top. So we would appreciate that very, very much. Um, yeah, right. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, that was the whole whole thing when we came together. Um, the others can attest to this. It was tolerance, the intolerance of last year. It it didn't matter. Like you said, if you sneezed, you know, um, my son, my husband and I were at Mayo Clinic for an appointment for me. And he sat, he had a sum, summer cold. Actually, it was allergies. He had his mask on and he's coughing and the whole waiting room emptied. 
you know, yeah. uh, just, um, and it's like, I mean, he wasn't offended. He knew exactly what was going on. He just chuckled, but it was the fact that people are so afraid that they became it so intolerant towards one another. And it was all fear driven. So that was our goal with this book was to find a way around it. There's always a way around intolerance. There's always, there's always a reason somebody does something. All you have to do is find out that reason. So thank you. Thank you, Nina. Welcome. Anything you. else? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I did. That's a, a, speaking of how often intolerance shows up, I, I have been in hundreds of groups at, at my age, and I have never found a group that didn't have one person at least who talked and talked and talked and talked and went off course, or somebody who tried to talk over other people, or people something. trying to one-up themselves. The, what? You thought you did it? <laughs> Are you trying to tell me something? No. <laughs> no I'm to tell you something. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> because this group has been phenomenal. Uh, uh, always cooperative, always helpful. Mm -hmm. I love this group. <laughs> I think yeah. as well, Kathleen, um, Kathleen, you mustn't be too modest as well. You're giving everyone else credit. But I think we'd all agree that where would we be without our leader? You know, the one person who's kept us all calm and we're all having kind of little panics here and there. Or maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we've been very lucky to have a lot of talent on the group. But we all need someone who just kind of holds us all together. And I, I think, you know that's that's where you've just been it for us really kathleen so thank you well thank you it's thank you all pleasure. i yeah, so she 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 you do a great job of making it sound like a democracy but it's really a dictatorship Let, let's be yeah. honest <laughs> that's and if you didn't i'm the mom charge, if you didn't take charge and and put everything in order someone has to do that you did that <laughs> yeah what mom says goes <laughs> <laughs> nobody's happy unless mom's happy <laughs> okay a lot of charm and uh in a sense of humor <laughs> yes thank you does anybody else have any questions uh, if you if we don't then well there's Just nothing else in the chat short, a short one for how long a period will the anthology be 99 cents instead of 4.99 Probably another week. Okay, better get to it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. So that's why you want to go ahead and tell as many people as you want that if they want to save four dollars, get it now. Gotcha. And there is still plans for a uh, both a print on demand and uh, I discovered today that bookstores, if they purchase their books through a certain uh, uh, company, can actually order books. Uh, so if, if somebody likes our books uh, and libraries as well, if they can get them through that service, because I have had a librarian, one of the towns that we used to live in, found out that I had contributed to this book. And, uh, you know, as as authors, we want our works to be read. If we can make a little bit of money, that's great. But we want our books to be read. But I think all of us are, are going to be tickled pink to know that there's a copy of something that we wrote collecting dust on a library shelf somewhere. <laughs> okay, thank you again for coming. And we appreciate meeting everyone and your questions and your comments. May you have a blessed day today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And, Thank and, you. and, and good luck. Henia, Henia, you received a message from Diane. Henia. Just Oh, Diane. Okay. Henia? I can't see it. But yeah, Henia I see a, uh, Diane. Or oh, is it Nina or Diane? Diane, from Diane. Um, and, uh, and oh, for, yeah, I see that. And for is the Diane print, here? Yes. She is, is she here? She is. Diane Sensual. She's holding her finger. Okay. Fill in the screen. Oh.
I see you, Diane, I see you. Um, so your question is, okay, a uh, child of a Holocaust survivor, do you know, I'm sure you're aware that when you're a child of a Holocaust survivor, you're actually a Holocaust survivor yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, an indirect way you get, you get um, the same feeling that the same dread feeling that you walk with for the rest of your life and the unbelievability of it and the sadness of it and the heart of it. And, um, and many second and third generation, especially third generation, would rather forget about it. And I don't think we should forget about it, not only because we are Jewish, because it's humans, what humans can do to one another that can be absolutely horrible. Uh, so yes, it affected me a great deal and it will for the rest of my life. It's something that I'm dealing with. So I don't know if I answered your question or your yeah. comment actually. Thank you very, very much for sharing that. I asked it also because Estelle Chaitin, who had to leave, who, um, who joined via Anna, um, had her four novels each have something, uh, not a, a direct Holocaust theme, but they all deal with Holocaust survivors and Holocaust people. And, she was just interested and she may be in contact with you. I don't know. Yeah, well, I'm in Israel every year and I, I know the whole community pretty much. Okay, and I had so a few things published there. By but Anna, anyway. By Anna, we could meet yeah. you. Okay. Thank you and to everybody. Yeah, de oh, you definitely will meet me when I'm there. I can't wait to be there. Thanks for your question. I appreciate that. And one last question was when the print would be available on Amazon. It will, it, we're working on it. It should come soon. So it, it That's just, what there they is keep back telling order. Us. Yes. There is a back order because of COVID, but, mm -hmm. but it's coming. It will be available uh, like on print on demand. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? That's all I saw. Good luck okay. to all of you. Sounds Thank amazing. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. I started reading the book. I've read about two stories, the two first ones. Okay. That's a little carry on. Read the last one. <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> and the middle one. Continue reading. Don't stop reading it. Don't stop reading. I won't. I yeah. won't. I'll carry on. Continue reading. Okay. I'll do it to the end. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for reading. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.